Welcome to episode 48 of Oscar Sunday. I'm Austin Johnson. I'm Connor Rezegary. And today we will be talking about Thomas Vinterberg's Another Round from 2020, which just won the Oscar last week for Best International Feature Film. Oh man, that was an interesting show. And I think Vinterberg had one of the, one of the true special moments of the show uh, and one that has been totally criticized <laughs> <laughs> throughout, throughout the week. Um, he was also nominated for Best Director, Thomas Vinterberg. He lost to Chloe Zhao. Uh, we all kind of saw that coming. His 2012 film, The Hunt, uh, is his only other film, aside from Another Round, to get an Oscar nomination. And I know you just watched that for the first time. What did you think? It was, it was breathtaking. Uh, the Hunt was a powerful uh, film about just, you know, a, a true witch hunt. And I thought it was really smart. Um, I had a little problem with the ending, but okay. Overall, I, I thought- definitely, yeah, I definitely want to talk about that. I mean, I think the hunt is anytime you get a chance to talk about it, you should just go ahead and go ahead and get it out there. The hunt only got one nomination at the 86th Academy Awards for, for best foreign film. Uh, it was, it, it lost to the great beauty, Paulo Sorrentino, understandable. Uh, the Broken Circle Breakdown was also up, uh, The Missing Picture, and Omar. So this is a group I don't know much about other than The Hunt. And, and I remember The Hunt being on Netflix years ago and watching it just kind of like, oh, I like Mads Mikkelsen, you know, so I'll see. This looks kind of interesting. Oh, man, you know, um, just a punishing, punishing film. Jesus. Totally totally deserves like it it deserves all like all of your attention like every every scene is uh has has you know miles and miles of intent and the direction is crazy good you know you know it's funny how it how long it takes for people to kind of catch on to these foreign filmmakers right thomas vinterberg's been at it since the like mid 90s you know Mm -hmm. um very similar to what happened to bong joon ho and lee isaac chung you know these guys, we just catch on super late because the nature of the Oscars to even have a best foreign, you know, foreign language film category, you're already dividing them, spread, you know, giving them up. And people are just not going to be as interested when it's like, oh, what is this? These movies from all over the world. I don't know why people that think that way. Uh, I know you and I don't. We want to see everything we can, no matter where it's from. But that's just not the nature of most people. Right. And. I, th- I think like, it's, it's just a, a bit dangerous. We've talked about that on this show. Uh, I think when we did the La Strada episode, I kind of got on my soapbox about how I just think the category is a bit silly and a bit redundant and kind of takes away, it, t- it takes away some of the respect uh, that they have for these films. Well, you know, it's an American mentality. We've always, it, Americans yes. have always considered themselves the center of the world. And very few people in this country actually travel outside of even their town. So yeah, to expect them to even care about a film from Denmark is, it's a bit much. So I'm not surprised. I, I wish people thought more globally, but you know, that's. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I, I remember, you know, there was like the famous quotes from our last president after Parasite one about how, like, you know, how did this movie win? You know, <laughs> we have these issues with Korea, this and that stupid shit. And then he was asked like, have you seen it? And he's like, I don't know. I don't even know if it's any good. It's like, ha, that's right. it right there. That's it. That, that is, that says it all, you know, it says it's totally the attitude of so many people in our, you know, so many people in the Western part of the world to just like, not give a shit about other things that are happening. <laughs> and Parasite and it, it, is literally about assholes like him who are yeah, yeah. the world where yeah. the poor don't exist or they exist just to serve them. So yeah, yeah you should of see course it. he wouldn't you should see it. it. <laughs> you should see it, dude. You should check it out. You know no way he would something. fucking get it. No. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's fascinating to me though, that discussion, that kind of idea of like, well, what does this category even mean? But 
we know that the Oscars are, are very silly, silly in their own nature. So with that all being said, you and I love just grabbing a film from any of these categories and just watching it, embracing it, figuring out why, why is it there? Should it be there? What the hell? Why do these people vote on it? Um, and the hunt, the hunt is really good. You know, I, I give it a nine, um, four and a half stars in my letterbox. And I think it's, I think it's spectacular. The, you know, we're going to definitely going to spoil the movie because I want to definitely talk about the ending, but I, I think it's, there's, there's no doubt. And I understand why you would have problems with the ending. I kind of love it. I think it's kind of genius, but there's the first hour and a half is like gold, like pure gold. This is, this is some of the best, you know, thriller, you know, drama stuff I've ever seen. The hunt should have been way more recognized at that Oscars. Mickelson should have been up for best actor. Oh, no Kierkegaard kidding. Should have been up for director and screenplay. It should have been up for best picture. Uh, Thomas Bo Larson should have been up for best supporting. Like that movie should have just de- destroyed at that Oscars. That was one of the most harrowing human traumas I've seen in years. And I love that from the beginning, you know, he's innocent. Like, you know, oh, yeah. it's completely yeah. harmless, but everyone trusts the kid and no one ever even asks him what happened. Like they just assume he touched this kid. And his whole life is destroyed, and it's so fucking tragic. Yeah, just mass hysteria, like yeah. fucking, just gone. They've gone. Yeah, yeah, and it's and it's 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 brilliantly just kind of the way it kind of unfolds and how it it stays relentless the whole time, you know. And when Marcus, his son, gets like comes into play, it just gets even harder and harder. And Fanny, the dog, oh, like God. what the fuck, you know? This shit, this shit is crazy. It's a, it's a wild wild ride and rewatching it you know this past week for, for, for this episode I, I i was i was in the same boat as you just like why didn't this just wreck that oscars you know and you know i'm not we're not just saying at most oscars it should wreck but the 86th academy awards this would be uh the one that happened in 2014 but recognizing the films of 2013 you, you have american hustle is in there get that shit out of there Get that shit out of there. Uh, I think The Hunt is better than half of these movies in this group. Truly, truly. That's Wolf of Wall Street, Philomena, Nebraska, Her, Gravity, Dallas Buyers Club, Captain Phillips, American Hustle, and The Winner, 12 Years a Slave. It does. Like, come on. <laughs> come on. Yeah. And obviously, you got, some of you guys saw it because it, it's here. Yeah. That's the shit that frustrates me. It's like, ha, come on. Like, what are you doing? You're blatantly picking these these like American as hell movies. Come on. Like, come on. Well, and also like we learned that most of the voting Academy don't even watch them. Like don't even watch the movie. They watch like a 10, a 10 minute clip. <sighs> yeah. So I can Bastards. understand that, you know, if they have, if they just watch assorted clips from the hunt, why would they nominate it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Dep- especially depending on what they are. Right. Like Jesus. I mean, you could catch some really strange bits from the, that film and not be able to put it together at all. So stupid. Um, it, yeah. It's, it's a total heavy hitter. The, the stuff with Clara, the, the young girl, is like when it comes to, you know, a, you know, a full on adult Mads and this, this young girl, like on screen together is like, like insanity. It's some of the most incredible acting from a child and adult I've ever seen. Well, it also speaks so much to his character, to Lucas's character of he doesn't explode at this kid like you ruined my life. He's trying his hardest to shield her from harm even then. Like he's a good person. And that's the worst part is he has, he's done nothing at all to deserve this hate and this fear. And I love at the end when he finally breaks, like you don't get to do this to me. Like it's, that's what I wanted. That's what ruined the ending for me is he never got justice. And no, no, no. Justice. <laughs> yeah, of course, me too. And and that, like, man, this scene in the church. Oh, it, when he, yeah, when he's just grabbing Theo, you know. When he just and, looks back at him, like, half oh, anger, half sad that he lost his best friend. Like, just, oh, it's perfect. It's perfect. Like, you see just Mickelson, like, Vinterberg brings out the best in Mickelson. He really does. They, they are so good. It's like, you know, Scorsese and De Niro. It's a perfect matchup. Yes. Oh, yes. And one of the best things about that, that connection is, is, is Matt Mads is so, so good. 
at allowing someone else to kind of take, you know, he can play second fiddle for, for, for a minute. Yeah. He's so good at working with others. So, so good. And there's some scenes in this film. Uh, I think when Marcus goes to, um, goes to his God, his godfather's house and they're like at the hunting, you know, it's like they're hunting society, you know, a little community. It's really cool. Really, really interesting. When he's explaining to him, like, what happened when they all say in the basement and Marcus is like, but we don't have a basement. Like that scene is bone chilling. I'm getting chills all over thinking about that moment when you're just like, Oh my God, like, Oh my God, he's got a chance. You know, he's got a chance. And yeah, it's like, it strings you along like nobody's business. It's great. That scene reminded me so much of the actual satanic panic that happened in the, in the States in the eighties where a whole bunch of people, a whole bunch of kids like under hypnosis started accusing their daycare center person of uh, molesting them. And they would all, they all shared the same story of like being taken to the basement and like there was a satanic ritual and all this crazy shit, but the daycare didn't have a basement. And like all of that really did happen, but the guy still went to prison like on conjecture. Like it was a whole crazy story built on hypnotherapy and how dangerous that can be when in when improperly used and that just this movie reminded me of that because shit like this happens a lot you know? yeah yeah you don't need proof when the court of public opinion has already condemned you their proof can do nothing and that's you know the scariest situation this this movie is so believable because this has fucking happened yes yeah yeah exactly and it it not only masters those kind of like thrilling moments you know where you're like whoa like what what the hell is going to happen next it when he goes to the grocery store mm. and he's trying to you know these little things were just kind of like plays off of again the kind of mass hysteria thing like the crucible just kind of like these people just mob mentality just like yeah. ah it's it's fun to just beat someone up when they're down you know and that's just that's just such a shitty part of of human nature like but to put it on screen is so ballsy and doing it, you know, doing it in this way, uh, in this entertaining story that <laughs> has has all these facets, you know, with uh, I think her name's Naja, the girl that he dates. Yeah, there's all these different little plot lines, and I mean, just his relationship with Theo, and at the end on Christmas Day when they have the drink together, man, like the fuck. But the ending, the ending of the uh, of the hunt. Do you take issue with just the fact that he doesn't quite get justice or the actual final shots or what is it? The gunshot in the woods I thought was brilliant. That part I was like, okay. What really irritated me was the fact that he's just back with the society again. Like they all just, you know, forgave and forgot. Like after the way they treated him, like I wanted him to have his moment where he's like, you know, you all abandoned me. And I, I didn't do shit. Yeah. I wanted that moment and we never got that moment. Yeah. He just kind of folded back into. Yeah. Like it just kind of, you know, went away, but the brother, obviously that, you know, we don't see him, but that's definitely Clara's brother uh, taking the shot at him. That made sense and gave you know, gave me the idea that this is never going away. This stain is permanent, no matter what he says. It, and exactly. His days exactly. Are numbered. Uh, yeah, I, I liked it a lot. I just, I wish we'd gotten to have a moment where Lucas got to kind of, you know, judge them. Yeah, I know, I know what you mean. There's, there's like a lack of almost closure between him and yeah, like that communication. Yeah. Fascinating stuff. Fascinating stuff. Uh, I, I, I want to buy this movie for sure. I want to, want to own this one. I, and it, I just like, just like another round, just, I just want to watch more Vinterberg movies. Yeah, absolutely. I've been, you know, a door has been opened and I plan to walk through it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I definitely. This, there, I have no hesitation. This guy clearly wants to entertain. You know, he wants to get into your kind of into your gears, into your skin and make you make you click, make you tick. It's cool. Make you. Th yeah, he wants to, you know, entertain you, but he also really wants to kind of make you think about your life and the decisions you've made. It's a very both of these films really kind of make you reflect on. Am I happy? Am I doing the right thing in life? And I yeah. love that they both did that. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I mean. The subject matter alone, you know, is. Yeah. In both film in both films is again, like, I think I said earlier, it's just ballsy. It's like. What, 
And I plan yeah. to like, I'm studying to be a teacher right now. So I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about like, you know, 20 years from now, am I going to have a moment where I'm like, did I, like, is this what I wanted from life? Like, I don't know. Am I? We'll see. <laughs> Shit. I mean, that's a, that's a thought that uh, uh, scare a lot of people, you know, just in the future, am I going to be okay with what I'm doing when I, I, I if, with what I'm doing to get there? Yeah. It's really scary, is, scary is, thoughts. 40 year old Connor going to be super pissed at 20 year old Connor for not making the right decisions. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> brilliant. Brilliant. I love it, man. Yeah. I, I'm really glad we got to kind of include the hunt yep. on this show. I, I wanted, I wanted to open up right away. Cause I know we both, both were kind of just floored by it. So I, I have, I have a lot of fun with these kind of connected movies that we attach to the episode. Cause we'll be giving out awards to another round, you know, and we're going to dig into the 93rd Academy awards, which just happened last week. We'll look at that, that those two categories that, um, another round is in but these these extra you know it's almost like homework for us these these movies really matter because uh sometimes you'll get this where we like both but there's other times where maybe your perspective is different on on, on different films you know i think that fellini episode is really cool where you liked la strada but you were like what is eight and a half like what are we doing like why why is this praised and i love that aspect of the show is that we get different takes on filmmakers yeah it's become kind of a you know kind of a round table of really film history i like this podcast yes you've kind of picked these individuals to base these episodes around and determine whether or not their position in oscar history is deserved and sometimes you know you might love the guy i might hate the guy or vice versa and it's it's cool to have those differing perspectives but i also like when we're both like very much on the same page like this guy like vinterberg yeah, I, I just I, I knew deep down, you know, I, there there are, you know, filmmakers, of course, where you're like, oh, you're going to like more than others. I felt I felt really confident that you were going to fall in love with this guy. <laughs> um, I remember. It was our very first episode of Sneak Preview. Uh, we did our top 10 films of 2020. Yeah, I, I had another round out like a number four or five somewhere somewhere in there. I, you know, I watched it, I want to say in December, I believe, you know, and, and rewatching it, it is just totally special. Right. And I think you were waiting, you knew it was coming for this show to Oscar Sunday. Yeah. And, and, and I was waiting till last week to happen <laughs> <laughs> because th this, I love sound of metal, but this is my, this is my favorite movie that's nominated here at the 93rd Academy Awards. This is just super super special and i know i i know you knew that and you had to kind of wait <laughs> wait for this this moment so I'm, I'm glad we're here finally here at episode 48 we can talk a little bit about last week um we did on sneak preview we did kind of a recap about our thoughts on the show um last monday so i don't really want to dig into the you know the the ceremony too much but i do i do want to talk about this director group man you know and now, what do you think? <laughs> you know, because it totally changes when you see another movie. Absolutely. Absolutely. So these guys are nominees for Best Director at the 93rd Oscars. We have Thomas Vinterberg for another round, David Fincher for Mank, Lee Isaac Chung for Minari, Emerald Fennell for Promising Young Woman, and the winner, Chloe Zhao for Nomadland. Uh, as we said in our sneak preview, uh, Chloe Zhao's win was probably the, you know, most expected award of the night. She'd had a clean sweep of every other award during the season. And yeah, she was destined to get this one. And uh, after seeing another round, I think Thomas Vinterberg deserved to be here, but I do still think Chloe Zhao deserved the Oscar. Fair enough. Yeah. I totally understand that. I mean, yeah, she's kind of what you take away. She kind of did it all with that movie and giving her that Oscars not only <clears throat> historic in the sense that she's only the second woman ever to win the award out of 93 yikes it's a just it's a just total dominant performance from a director totally nomad land and Vinterberg is doing some cool stuff and no, another round but I, but I'm with you man I'm with you it's not it's not a it's not a winner exactly it's definitely who I was pulling for just because I love him yeah 
but seeing him get on stage for the, you know, for, for the win, it was very early on in the show. And he kind of explained, you know, what happened with his daughter and what the film is kind of about to him and kind of like about how you can kind of lose control, but you also, sh- you, you also sometimes should let go. It's just, it's very, very, very real, you know, and, and a lot of the lines in the movie reflect exactly what he was saying. That, that scene with Sebastian, the young kid at the end, when he's doing his exam is like, that's what Vinterberg was saying on stage. Like, that's what he was saying. Like you, you have, you have to admit you're fallible to, to love life, love others and enjoy things. Yeah. That's man, you know, and Vinterberg just kind of took everybody away. Uh, any other Oscars that wouldn't have happened. Cause he went on forever. Quest love was not playing anybody off. So you just kind of had this special organic moment with him. And it was really cool. It was, it, it made me more excited to watch, to watch this movie. It made me want to really check this out knowing, you know, I love when a filmmaker has such a personal connection to something they made. You can always tell that that's the true art. Like that's the stuff they pulled for. And this movie is very much a labor of love. You can feel it. Uh, and it is, you know, very much about the kind of the antithesis of human nature is to admit failure, admit that you need help. And I, this movie is very much about how important it is to admit that you are not alone. And I, I, I love that. I love that sentimentality. And yeah, it's fantastic. Yeah, super good. Of the, of the uh, other films in the best international feature film, which one do you want to see? Because uh, both of us, this is the only one we have seen, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, I know nothing about the rest of these films. Uh, looking at first uh, ideas here, I think Better Days I would like to check out. <clears throat> yeah. Um, collective sounds intriguing for sure. Oh, yeah, I got to see that. Yeah, that's on Hulu right now. So I'm, I'm going to do that very soon. I got, you know, I lived in Romania for a while. So I want to see that. I want to see that doc for sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to all of them, really. Like, I don't really have favorites. I, I don't know enough about them to really make a favorite. So I, I think I'll just have to watch all of them. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the goal for sure. I mean, uh, you got a film from Bosnia. That's, yeah, I'm in, you know, I'm, it doesn't, doesn't really matter, right? You just kind of dive in. And with these movies, there is some sort of context because of the Oscars. And that's what we like about it. Even though the fuckers don't watch all the movies, we like that there's context to kind of put movies together and see which ones we like. Uh, I think it's funny that we have higher standards in the actual Academy. Like we won't talk yeah, about anything yeah. unless we've actually watched the damn thing, but they'll just watch clips and be like, here's a statue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, think about how many, uh, just like, uh, you know, writers out there, podcasters that are watching, you know, uh, of course you and I are, are doing this, but there, there's, there's a lot of people out there just watching tons and tons of movies each year, old movies, movies that are coming out right now. And, you know, like, why aren't those people deciding what's happening? Because if you haven't seen all of these movies or don't have a huge palette, then I, I just don't. I don't understand. So we should, yeah, it should be like some of the best writers and, and whatnot that decide, decide what the movies are that, that get nominated. Like, like first cow people love first cow and recognize this. Like, how is it not here? Did you guys not see it? Like, that's crazy. <laughs> like, I wouldn't be a judge in a major food competition. If I hated vegetables. Yeah. Like, you know, there you go. There it's you ridiculous. Go. Like, well, I don't, I don't, I'll never understand their voting process. It's, so unnecessarily stupid. complicated it's stupid stupid and with the foreign language you just get lost with this category because you read about how you know each country gets one you know movie that they can put in you know th- there's no way you could have five danish movies they just don't allow that there's only one that can be nominated from each country and it just gets these all these weird rules and collective is a documentary and it's up there's not any documentaries ever up for best picture. Like what is going on? What does this even mean? <laughs> and it's, it's, it's odd. It's odd for sure. But goddamn, another round is good. <laughs> yes, it is. And, and, you know, P- parasites, the last one that won, of course you've seen that. Uh, 
I would like to point out the Criterion channel does have the uh, the category that has a bunch of foreign language film winners. I think it's like 25 of them or something just in there right now. Uh, definitely check that out when you have a chance, you know, just kind of take a plunge at one of them. Yeah. You never know. You might get an official story from 1985 every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Cool stuff. <laughs> Um, you remember, you, you remember, uh, I don't know what episode it was, what number, but that group, uh, official story was with, uh, uh purple rose of Cairo, uh, back to the future, <laughs> Brazil and witness. Yeah. 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 An odd bunch of films. That was, I was not <laughs> expecting that going into back to the future. That was great. No, no. I kind of, I kind of like all of them. And then I really fell in love with, uh, with official story. Uh, in Brazil, man, I think about Brazil still like a lot now these days. Uh, I've been wanting to rewatch it. <laughs> I love, I love those little things that you kind of remember from. That's the homework that we do, you know. For that week, we watched five movies, you know. <laughs> it's, the, it's the prep. It's I have a whole um, letterboxed uh, list that's just Oscar Sunday prep, and it's it, not including the major movie we do each week. And the prep alone is it's well over a hundred films. <laughs> <laughs> yeah and we're not even a year in yet yeah uh that's 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 the goal though is to just just kind of consume it as we go um you, you got anything you want to say about the the 93rd academy awards before we kind of dive into our own awards um in the future don't do best picture in the middle of the show it completely slows the momentum and only pissed people off especially considering you didn't end it with a bozeman tribute so <laughs> That's all I have to say about the 93rd Oscars. Yeah, definitely. Oh, man, they've felt the backlash. Holy shit. <laughs> People called it yeah. the Game of Thrones finale of Oscars. <laughs> yeah, where I'm like, oh, I kind of enjoyed it. <laughs> I had a good time with the show. I just was like, you made some very weird decisions here, and you're going to regret them. <laughs> yes, and they have. They have, and uh, it's going to be completely different next year again. <laughs> That's for sure. Uh, but but again, it's all about it's all about the films and another round. This is what we have here today for these awards. Uh, we, we've you know had an absolute blast doing these, and I, I say this all the time that it's very difficult. But there's there's something specifically about these awards that was that was very difficult for me to decide. And I'll kind of tell you at the end, but it has to do with the Inyo and the Deacons. I was very. <laughs> Very uh, confused on how I should play this out. So I'm going to have a lot of fun hearing what you got. Uh, of course, we have the Tarantino for best quote or line of the movie. We have the Ennio Morricone for best music moment or needle drop, what have you. We have the Philip Seymour Hoffman Award for the best performance of the movie, whoever won the movie in our, our eyes. And then we have the Roger Deakins Award for the best scene or moment of the movie. Uh, why don't you take it away with your Tarantino? <laughs> Oh, so already this, you know, this film is about four teachers who decide to give a psychological uh, study a try where they spend their entire waking hours at least a little drunk just to try to make their lives a little bit more relaxed and exciting. So with that in mind, <laughs> their teaching styles begin to change pretty drastically, especially Tommy's. <laughs> and um, Yes, yes. For me, uh, the line that I picked for my uh, Tarantino is when he's coaching while drunk and he yells at the kids, if I'm to spend my spare time on you little piss ants, you better behave. <laughs> that is oh my God. perfect little league coach, like drunk coach talk. It's perfect. Specs, specs. <laughs> Thomas Bo Larson as Tommy, uh, and it, he plays Theo in The Hunt, right? Yeah. You know, and this is a this is a guy that Vinterberg has used over and over and over. There's clearly a, a level of trust there. Tom Thomas Bo Larson's IMDb picture might be the best IMDb picture on the entire fucking website. He has sunglasses on. His shirt is unbuttoned a little bit. <laughs> um, he has a Che tattoo on his chest uh awesome <laughs> and and he's got a vape pen in his mouth 
this 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 guy uh i i one of my very 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 favorite things about this show is i, I call it the burt lancaster uh you know fucking illness is when a, a performer just just takes you just takes you by heart and thomas bo larson has just kind of i knew mads mickelson you know yeah could work you know i know this guy can can do his thing but Thomas Bo Larson rewatching the hunt, rewatching the another round this week. I was just like, man, what in the hell? I got to see all these other Venturberg movies. Yeah. Oh, I want to see him for Venturberg, but I got, I want to see Thomas Bo Larson work more. He, he is unbelievable. The scene where he is just like, he is just drunk and he's walking back into the gym to go get uh, his bottles that are all over the place. That scene, I sent a video of it to my brothers, uh, Adam and Jeremy, because I, <laughs> It's one of those things that just, I was just laughing. I, like, um, I was fucking rolling around on the ground because he's, he's dribbling a ball and he can't dribble it like at all because he's fucking drunk. And it kind of, the way it kind of bounces off of him and then he, he, he fumbles it and he looks back at the camera. <gasps> G- genius stuff. And then he goes into the gym and then he sees that this janitor has totally got his stash. <laughs> uh, breathtaking stuff. I, I wrote that quote down that one that you had, because it to me is the funniest line of the whole movie. Yeah. But, but, but then I, then I, then I rewatched a scene and just kind of, I was kind of taken aback by, by, by this scene. And it was almost, uh, it was almost my deacons. Um, so my Tarantino goes to this, uh, this line from Martin when he's teaching, that's Mads Mikkelsen's character. Yeah. Uh, when he's teaching uh, and he's talking to these kids about the lake race, this, this race that they do, <laughs> They go around, they just drink a shit ton, you know, uh, it looks like a lot of fun, honestly. And Martin says, um, so when you run around totally wasted, throwing up in bushes and alleys, don't feel, don't feel alone because you're in great company. And he's talking about, you know, he's talking about Winston Churchill. <laughs> uh, and, you know, there's, there's multiple moments where Martin is clearly intoxicated and his teaching is just incredible. It just goes to it, you know, and he says that in the movie. He's like, I've never, t- I haven't taught like this in years. He's like, even when I'm sober, I feel great. There's something to this. Yeah. There's something to this. And those, those moments in that classroom where he just kind of is, he's just fucking turned on. It is, it is great stuff. I agree. It is great stuff. Um, I hope one day to be as great a teacher as drunk Martin. <laughs> in terms of history yeah fantastic yeah i mean uh, and i love how they all kind of have their moment where it like it it works for a minute yeah (laughs) and those moments are so funny like when he when Spex gets the goal in the for for tommy's soccer team and you're just like yes and when (laughs) um uh peter is teaching his class and they actually sing in harmony and he's like all right (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> let's go and Nicolaj is, is starting to get into a groove and getting people's attention it's it's that stuff is cool yeah it's because we all need to you know not take shit so seriously once in a while and just kind of loosen up i like that i like the idea that you know just don't just stop giving a fuck for like an hour <laughs> yeah and great things yeah, will just- happen just 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 chill out you know and that's that's uh i guess we should say that the 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 reason they're drinking it, it, i don't know how to properly say his name finn skardegard i i don't i don't, I don't know he's it, his his theory is that uh the blood alcohol content in a in human's body is it has a deficit of negative 0.05 <laughs> and so that you should be at 0.05 at all times and that's how you should function always and that's, that's why we get these moments. Um, and then they push it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. We can go, like, we can go farther. It's, it's, there's something to this. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And it does oh, have man. its pretty, you know, harsh consequences in the uh, end. Yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah, it's definitely the kind of like the roller coaster going up and coming down. Yep. Mm-hmm. Oh, so good. Yeah. There's a lot. This, this screenplay is, is fantastic. It's wonderful. A lot of lines. I like that we both kind of picked one that was funny because this movie, it, above all else, will make you laugh, man. It'll get you, it'll get you going. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think this. Do you think this should have been up for screenplay? Hell yeah! yeah. In this yeah. group, come on, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, th- I just think this movie is one of the best at this show. It just 
it's uber, uber, uber good. And I don't think you can say that about all the ones in best pick, the best picture group. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, and screenplay for sure. Fair enough. If you had to take one out and put in another round, which one would it be for original screenplay? For original screenplay, I got you have the five in front of you. Mm-hmm. It's, name, uh, name them off. Yeah. So the winner was Promising Young Woman. Then there was Judas and the Black Messiah, Minari, Sound of Metal, and the Trial of the Chicago Seven. Probably Trial of Chicago Seven. I would take out for this. Mm, uh, sacrificing Sorkin for Vinterberg. That. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hell yeah. Love Sorkin to death. But. Yeah. Uh, top five type type thing. Yeah, I think I think another round. Would would take it take its spot. Do you think there is one that it rivals in there? Sound of Metal, maybe. Sound of Metal, I could see. I think it has great moments in the screenplay, but it's not my favorite part of the movie. Um, I'd lose Minari. That's fair. That's fair. There's nothing totally overwhelming about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think another round has, you know, something really important to say in regards to like our general happiness mm-hmm. and how important it is to go through life at least a little bit happy. Yeah. I saw, I saw a review on Letterboxd where someone just said, this movie's pure serotonin. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty good. Um, so I have a feeling uh, we're going to be in a very similar spot with the Morricone. Okay. Okay. So this, this is the one that's really interesting to me, right? Is uh, if you've seen this movie, you'll kind of know where we're maybe, maybe you'll kind of know where we're going because yeah, I, I think, I think this one is just really, really difficult to choose, but then I kind of changed, changed how I viewed all of my awards. So uh, I'll let you do your annual first, but it still might be the same thing. We'll see. Uh, well, I had a feeling it was going to be here since like the very first thing you ever told me about this movie was it's, uh, impressive use of the meters sissy strut. Yeah. And I was waiting for that and I knew it was going to, it was fucking great. Just sissy strut and a round of Sazerac. It doesn't get any better than that. It's a great scene. Just these four guys just, you know, unwinding with some heavy drinks and, um, this epic meter song playing that, you know, kind of pops up every now and then in films like this and uh, just yeah. kind of represents their general good mood. And I love it. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Yeah. I, of course, Sissy Strutt being in Jackie Brown. And this is just double whammy, two of the coolest needle drops, you know, that I can think of. And I, yeah, I, I, I love it, but I, but I chose for this award. I chose, I chose the, 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 the kind of theme song of the movies, one life by Scarlet pleasure. Uh, man, the finale of the movie, and you know, with that song playing, just yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so good. And I, of course, started listening to Scarlet Pleasure. Don't really like them at all. <laughs> I listened to some of their other songs. They're like a really, really popular Danish band, and apparently they're kind of, uh, you know, I don't know much about Scandinavian music, but they're kind of trendsetters in that, that part of the world. So that's really cool. But the music is not for me. Uh, even this song, if I heard it just on the radio, I would change it right away, but there's something about the touch, this touch and you know, how it plays into the movie and the the lyrics of it and how kind of lackadaisical Mads Mikkelsen gets when he, when it's on, it is, is so special. And when a song that I don't really like, by a band that I don't really care for is used that well in a movie. I, I can't ignore it. Did you read in the trivia, the crazy connection Mickelson has to Scarlet pleasure? No, no. Is he related to one of them? Check this out. So here's the trivia blurb in IMDb years ago when Mads Mickelson's daughter was a teenager, he picked her up at a party and he picked a young guy up. He was dressed in a 60s suit and really pointed shoes. And he was drunk as a dog. He was just totally drunk, and Mickelson's daughter asked her father to drive the guy home, and Mickelson did that. Then the guy was insisting on carrying this whole crate of beers. He wanted it back home with him, and so they did that. And then a couple of months later, it happened again, the same guy. Mickelson just drove him home a couple times. In a surreal coincidence, and unbeknownst to Mickelson, the guy is Emil Gall, the lead singer of the band Scarlet Pleasure. And their song, What a Life, accompanies the final scene of the film years later. What in the world? In the words of Mickelson, Quote, it was a crazy circle. 
<laughs> that's genius. That's my Tarantino. It was a crazy circle. <laughs> oh my gosh i love that man i love that thanks for sharing that that's really cool (laughs) that's fantastic and yeah i get why you picked that it's a great way to kind of round this movie out with nicholson doing his crazy jazz ballet on the docks and uh just this kind of general kind of a mixture of like pleasure and depression over the loss of a friend and it just, it makes this weird hybrid that works. Like, it's almost like he's punishing himself, but also celebrating the fact that he's alive. It's, it's perfect. It's a great. Yeah. Combo. Yeah. It's, it's, it's totally playing off of, uh, again, what Sebastian says in his exam. It's like you admitting that mm, my shit's fucked. You know, I don't know. I don't know what's going on. Uh, but, but I do know right now I want to dance, you know, and that, that's, that's it. That's like, what more can you ask for? And Matt, Mads, the dude, the dude is, he, he's totally at this point, just underrated. He's just underrated. People just don't fucking understand. Uh, this guy's one of the best people we have right now uh, in, in the acting kind of game. He's, 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 he can kind of do anything. He's one of my favorite character actors. And yeah, when I found out like he did not use a double during that whole scene, that's all him really I dancing know. like he yeah. hadn't danced in 20 30 years and thomas vinterberg dared him like i bet you can't still dance and he's like oh i can dance yeah <laughs> there we go i love that yeah mm, they bring man. out the best in each other yeah can you imagine being on set for that for that moment <laughs> mads is just he's just gone to a different place that's why that's why you get the reaction you do out of all these other people they're like holy shit look at him he's doing cartwheels <laughs> it's it's magical it's a great you know it's like a bollywood ending it's crazy yeah, God, God, I love it. Awesome stuff, man. Uh, yeah, the the Enyo the definitely a difficult one to do. Uh, PSH. I mean, Easy. it's 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 Mickelson. It's clearly Mickelson for me. I'm, yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I don't yeah. care. Oh uh, yeah, I, I don't care either. Uh, I think everyone, everyone in this movie does does a does a does a wonderful job. I cannot remember the actress's name. He, she plays Annika, his his wife. Jeez, dude, <laughs> she is awesome. That scene when she just kind of calls him out. Uh, uh, Maria Bonavi. Yeah, she is fantastic. I I love the scene when they're at home and she just kind of is like, "What are you? What the fuck are you doing?" Like, <laughs> like, dude. And he's like, you know, just kind of uh, mumbling and you know going around she's like you're drinking wine now i guess so you know it, she's she's perfect you know balance balances uh mads wonderfully and Tom, thomas bo larson is is awesome as tommy awesome performance really really wish he would have gotten a best supporting actor nod uh but mads the guy the guy could have won the oscar man this guy if he's in the if he gets in the group and people are like oh okay I think he could have won. I think this, this performance is that good. It'll and happen. What, and what, a, yeah. And what a special week to watch the hunt and this, you know, a Vinterberg Mickelson kind of double feature. He's, he, he, he's totally special. And those two movies are essential to kind of understanding his filmography. I think he really deserved, I think he really could have won for the hunt and another round. There's definitely moments, but yeah, just to have been nominated, I think would have been huge for him. He's, I think he's, I, I, he's, I don't, I feel like he's not as well known as we think he is because he's so special to us. Yeah, no, he's underrated. He's underrated. There's no doubt about that. I even think he should have been nominated for best supporting actor in Casino Royale. Uh, this guy, it's long overdue to me. His kind of, his kind of, his praise. Yeah. Uh, I, I would be silly to not mention his work in TV. Hannibal mm-hmm. uh, does it does it just as good as anybody, uh, and a character that obviously has been played by a legend or two. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, he he's he's the man. He's a a total treasure to me. And the fact that he's going to be in Indiana Jones is just one of the most, you know, enthralling ideas and thoughts uh, ever. <laughs> yeah, he's already, you know, he's made his, he's been picked up by Marvel already, you know, his Star Wars. Kaecilius, he played, yeah, in Rogue One, he was uh, Galen Erso. 
Yeah, he's he's yeah. he's one. He's a franchise guy and a character actor who just keeps getting consistent work and great work, and he gives it his all every time. And I love the guy. He can play hero. He can play villain. His range is fantastic. Like, yeah, he's he's one of the best. Yeah, yeah. P- the peop- the general public may not know, but the industry knows how fucking good he is. You know, and yeah. I wish the Oscars would get on board. They will. He'll he'll get his. I'm sure he will at some point. Yeah, yeah. Th- th- this this award that was the easiest one for sure. The Philip Seymour Hoffman, I think. Mads. Uh, speaking of Philip Seymour Hoffman, you know, you you spoke about how Mads is one of your favorite character actors, you know, and it's it's awesome when we can kind of, uh, you know, mirror those you know those kind of performers. Philip Seymour Hoffman, obviously a character actor who was able to step in and be the lead, and that's obviously the kind of career Mads Mikkelsen has kind of formed. Yeah. And I, I, I'm speaking for both of us because I know we love, love, love those people. <laughs> they are the best. They're the reason I keep coming back to film. They're the reason I fell in love with film. Character actors who have the ability to hold an entire film on their shoulders. And exactly. Yeah, they're the best in the business. And I, they're the reason I'm here. <laughs> yeah, def- definitely. Definitely kind of uh, jolt you, you know, as a fan, you're like, oh, okay, what else can I see of this fucking guy? <laughs> you know? And that, that opens up a whole other world of directors and writers. And, but it first starts with those performers that you just fall in love with at a young age and you can't get it enough. And yeah, that's why we, that's why we call it the PSH. <laughs> uh, it's, it's no, 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 um, no hiding that here. Uh, the Deacons, here we are. Uh, we can definitely point out a few scenes if you want, but we both have to pick one winner. Uh, what, what do you got? Uh, you've already kind of brought it up. It's the scene where Martin finally reaches the kids by talking about the lake race and comparing them to mm. Grant Hemingway and Churchill. Uh, mostly because, you know, I'm a huge history buff, and I know that a lot of history's greatest so-called heroes, a lot of them are drunks who got lucky. <laughs> and Grant and Hemingway especially – are very much drunks who got lucky. And to see that recognized in a Danish film is really cool. And also to use that to reach kids, you know, by talking about, you know, you drink, history's greatest leaders love to drink too. It's not that bad. It's just, you know, you're, I like the whole idea of you're in great company. And he finally, he, he uses this to get these kids to finally pay attention to him and care. And that's great. It's his, you know, it's his dead poets moment. And it's fantastic. Oh, man. I, I looked at Brianna while we were watching this movie. And I was like, Con- you know, Connor's want- he's going to be a teacher, you know. And she's like, he could do that. You know, we're like, he can do that shit, you know. He, uh, he knows enough about, is passionate enough about these fucking people. The, when he first comes in and is like, I'm a, new, I'm a new fucking man, you know. And I'm about to, and he's like, hey fucking sit down, you know, <laughs> sit down. And he's, he, he says, okay, uh, you know, Josephine, right. That's your name. Okay. He's like, we have an election, three people. And he, he fucking does this with his sleeves. Yeah. He starts pulling them up and he does a whole bit about FDR Churchill and Adolf Hitler and how the first two chain smokers who suck, they're hard to work with. They, they drink all the time. They cheat on their wives. Adolf Hitler goes to bed early, doesn't drink, doesn't smoke you know, has everything in order. And they're like, well, yeah, we'd vote for the third guy. <laughs> I, I mean, man, and it, um, the scene that you, that you're talking about, he initially asked a student, you know, how many drinks do you have in a week? Right. And the student is talking about this, this like pulled me in like, like nobody's business. It was when the kid says, Oh, on the weekend, I, uh, you know, have what 10 to 15 drinks Saturday, Sunday, or sorry, Friday, Saturday, and, you know, I'll have, have a few on Sunday and then maybe on, you know, Tuesday, Wednesday for Champions League. <laughs> Champions League, that's my shit. I, you know, I, I, love, I love soccer to death. And, of course, you know, here, you know, this Danish guy kind of shouting it out, the Champions League, this awesome tournament amongst European clubs going at it. That's something that matters to me in the screenplay that just, just kind of reached out to me, just like the history stuff does with you, right? Yeah. That all happens in one, like, one swing. He does that all in one swing where he, he's, it's like this movie, this screenplay, if you have, if you have the attention span, it's, it's going to find you. It's going to find you. There's going to be something in this movie that just kind of clicks with you, even if it's just these guys getting wasted and dancing. 
I, I don't, I don't see where uh, someone couldn't enjoy this movie, man. And watching those scenes. And I was just thinking about you for sure. Like, I, I mean, in history of all things, <laughs> really cool, really cool stuff. Uh, like you said, maybe, maybe one day uh, we can have some teachers out there who are like drunk Martin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Incredible. The scene where he does the, the election quiz thing. I almost went with that. And yeah. Actually, they're both great. I did that to my cousins today. I asked them like, Hey, so I've, it's an election. There's three options. Like I did that to them and they were like, what? Like I got them. It was really cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's easy. Cause it's like, well, of course you're going to vote for the third one. You got to find out who it is. <laughs> funny, my cousin Brenna is like, this feels like a trick question. And I'm like, just pick somebody. <laughs> yeah. Like, just she pick was the strongest through it, but <laughs> it is a trick question. Yeah. Even the students knew it, but they were like, I'm, I got to vote for the one that's best for me. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> awesome stuff. <clears throat> yeah. I, I, I I had a hunch you'd go with some one of those scenes, yeah. uh, one of those teaching moments from from Martin. Um, we've already talked about this one too, uh, but I'll, I'll 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 ramble here a bit about it. The scene when Sissy Strutt plays, mm. very very special. Now, the scene initially starts with them. They're 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 a bit bit a bit worried and a bit confused on what to do. And Martin even says, I'm out. He says, I'm, I'm out. I got to go home. This is, I think we've taken this too far sort of thing. And so Nicolaj, Peter, and Tommy, they are like, well, we're not, you know, we're not done. And they start <laughs> making Sazeracs. Very, very strong drink. And they are, you know, just kind of pounding them, right? And the reactions they have are hilarious. It's like, what the fuck is this? You know, ah, they're, they're like, they're like on fire. You know, they're just like, this is crazy. Like a bunch of children. Um, and they can do this. These guys can do this because they're, they're uh, at Nicolaj's house and they can do this because his wife left with the three kids. Yeah. So you have, you have this moment of to them and from their perspective, this temporary freedom. Okay. Let's, let's fucking go wild here. And that's what they do. And that is enough to pull Martin back in, right? It's enough to pull Martin back in where he says, fuck it, give me one of those. And he takes a drink and he's like, shit. You know, it just, it hits him like, like he has a, he has an addiction. And that's when the movie just flips, flips on, you know, it really starts to really, really tip. And it gets really, really dangerous. But for a short moment, they are at Nicolaj's house listening to Sissy Strut and they're all dancing uh, to their own tune, you know, to their own beat really. And it is, it is beautiful. It's uh, not exactly what cinema is made for, but it's like the little things that you find within cinema where you can just, just fucking watch this extremely authentic setting of these dudes who have obviously been actually drinking Sazeracs <laughs> and are, are just having a good time. And if I were an actor, I would want Vinterberg directing me because that looks like fun as shit. That scene and uh, the, the song Sissy Strut is just, it just gets in your bones. And of course the, the call to, you know, uh, uh, I remember texting you is uh, I love Jackie Brown. So that is just such an easy way to my heart is to use a song that's from a different movie and put it in yours, even if it's not totally intentional. Obviously, I think it is here. I think he does it twice. He does it in the, the credits as well at the end. So <laughs> I, I, I love that touch. And it's not just that Sissy Strut's playing. It is everything around it. It is Martin getting pulled back in. It is them having this kind of temporary freedom and they take it way too far. Way, way, way too far. All Nicolaj had to do was get some fucking codfish and he couldn't even do that. And they all, they, they all get just piss piss drunk you know to a level where you, a level you don't want to go to and they go out and they're trashed martin falls asleep on the fucking road you know it, it goes too far yeah but there's that little there's that little temporary freedom and hope when sissy struts playing and they're all dancing drinking sazerac's the calm before the storm yeah well it reminds you that you know they they embarked on this journey together but they're all in their own little world escaping something personally 
Mm -hmm. whether it be, you know, family troubles or a midlife crisis or being alone or whatever it is. And this is kind of a wake up call for most of them. And, you know, Tommy doesn't get that call. Oh, no. And that's a, that's a ride. Uh, That's a ride that I think people stay away from in movies, you know, is having your character actually go there. You know, Tommy clearly is impacted the most uh, yeah. by this. He's, he, he's a full on alcoholic and l- loses his life while on the boat. And you, you, you just, you just hate to see that happen. But I think that kind of tone and that kind of un you know, unforgiving, you know, part of the story is, is so essential because it reminds you that it is not all fun and games. You can't get away with this all the time, you know? Um, and, and I, I very much appreciate it. Again, the balls that Vinterberg has to just take it to these, to the hunt and another round, just take it to this, these crazy levels, crazy, authentic, crazy, real, crazy, scary. And I, I love it. Well, also in the in the funeral scene and the after, you know, them going to the restaurant, you also you feel this kind of cloud of guilt. Yeah, that they all participated in this together, but that they, you know, did they're all thinking like, could I have done more? Like, could could we have helped him? Like, why yeah. didn't we see it? But it's never spoken, but you all you see it in all of their eyes. Like, they're all like, why didn't I save him? And Man. it's, I love that Vinterberg was and those actors were able to pull that off without a single word towards it but you could feel it that is smart filmmaking it, extremely extremely right this this movie just oozes with just skill yeah just attention to detail skill and and fucking you know the the emotion uh, you know we know now after his speech last week thomas venterberg that this like the his daughter passed away while this movie was being made yeah and you can you can just feel that the sincerity in, in in this film uh it it's over it's kind of over overpowering and i i say, same as the hunt you know i'm going to buy this movie you know when i when i when i find it uh it is on it is on hulu right now and i think it's just a damn shame that people are not watching it that people are pass it up i know I, I know it's not traditional you know you go see movies in theaters but just just everyone has fucking hulu right <laughs> i mean <laughs> jesus we all we all pay the fucking subscriptions for all these things check this one out it is you know it is totally worth it i give this fucker a year tops before it's in the criterion collection yeah oh no doubt you know venterberg's gonna have gonna have his criterion fucking section yeah it's gonna get a box set one of those nice blu-ray sets and then you can have a venterberg you know shopping spree (laughs) hell yeah i mean i'm 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 game uh the film you know kind of kind of did did well uh across the boards at other you know golden globes of course baftas all these different award shows but but you want to see it perform well at the oscars right yeah what what is the one thing if you could choose one nomination for this movie to get that it didn't get what would it be (sighs) um probably probably original screenplay I think that's the film's biggest strength. Okay. So you take Minari out, put, put that in. I totally understand that. Uh, Jeez. Yeah. We kind of talked a lot about our favorite moments of the screenplay, but it it is not only one of those ones that just punches you over and over. It's just a really well-crafted story that never, 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 never goes kind of outside of, Outside of itself, I guess uh, it, it goes to extreme levels, but I feel like he never reaches into places or or tries to tell a new story that just doesn't matter. I feel like that happens all the time, right? You watch a movie where there's bits and pieces of a screenplay that just like, what, what, why is this here? Why can't you just hone in and focus? This movie is so fucking focused on this experiment that these four teachers are having. Well, I noticed the same thing in The Hunt. Like Vinterberg tells a singular story with like the occasional branch, but it always comes back to the main narrative. And I, with that, you know, this guy's become just a a writer director. I'm going to be looking at. 
yeah. because he knows what he wants and he knows how to tell a story. And that's regardless of language or decade or, you know, whatever, that's what I look for is a guy yeah. or, you know, a man or a woman who knows how to tell a goddamn story. And Vinterberg's up there. Yeah, dude. Yeah. <laughs> awesome stuff. I'm, I'm really glad. I'm really glad we, we got to do this. You know, uh, last week was a lot of fun, right. You know, doing that special show where we kind of took movies out and put, you know, put movies in and, I, I would think right now where I stand, this would be the one I would put in from, from the most recent group. You know, there's, of course, I'm always going to watch more 2020 mil- films and stack those on. Uh, Never really, sometimes always is probably my personal favorite film of 2020, but another round I, I, again, just, I just don't understand how people don't, I, I couldn't just love it. Yeah. It's a, it's a heartwarming, heartbreaking story. It's weird. It's kind of, it straddles the line and really kind of works as a great film to kind of as a metaphor for a midlife crisis. It's a, it's a great lens into that experience. And yeah, yes, I I think it's fantastic. Good, man. Do you like one more than the other, uh, the hunt and another round? I think just because of how fucking ballsy it was, I do like the hunt a little bit better. That's fair. And I like another round a bit better. That makes, that kind of makes sense. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. Uh, I, I can't wait for you to re- be able to rewatch both of them because they, I'm telling, they both have insane rewatchability. You know, uh, just because 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 the skill level is so high. You know, uh, I know rewatching the hunt is not something you want to do just on any given night. <laughs> yeah. But but it but it man it was it is very rewatchable because of how just how damn precise it is. Well, I'm sure one day the hunt will probably get its own episode here. So that's, that's probably when I'll rewatch it. Yeah, very, very well could. Uh, that's, that's a good thought. That's something that uh, we could come back to Vinterberg and go ahead and knock out his two Academy, you know, award nominated films. <laughs> <laughs> I, w- I wish there was more, but I've noticed uh, looking at his filmography, you know, he's also worked as a director with a lot of different writers and I love seeing you know, like a spike, like Spike Lee's done that a lot. I, I love watching guys work with other people as well as kind of do their own thing, have their own vision. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to kind of, you know, keep my eye out. Yeah. He's a young man. There will be more nominations. Yeah. He's like 50. So yeah, he's got, he's got a lot of time. And same with Mads Mikkelsen. I think he's somewhere in his forties. Uh, speaking of forties, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, he's 46, I believe oh. 47. Um, what's going on there? What's going on with this? What, 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 what are we doing? So apparently, and this is not a surprise because this happens all the fucking time, Americans refuse to watch movies with subtitles, movies that are in a different language because that, you know, I'm a freedom or whatever the fuck. So Hollywood has to remake these you know, successful foreign films into American films. And another round has been put on the chopping block. Uh, Leo DiCaprio is circling it. Because I, I, we don't need it. This, this film kind of speaks to all of us. It's a global film. I don't understand why they do this all the time. It happens most of the time in horror, but you do see it in comedy and drama. And it's a travesty every time. I'm, it's, I don't like this at all. <sighs> stupid. Really stupid. And how long? Can a, can a movie breathe for a fucking second? Yeah. For a goddamn second, if every night it's the fucking chicken. <laughs> <laughs> oh, jeez, dude! I just kept scrolling when I saw I saw Leo when I saw another round. I was like, I don't even want to fucking know. I don't even. I'm sorry. I don't. I don't like that at all. It's really dumb. Really silly. It's on Hulu. Just check it out. <laughs> Fuck <Yeah>. the other one. <laughs> Learn to fucking read and watch another round. It's it's a great film. It's in yeah. It's in Danish. But I was able to follow it because <laughs> I read it. <laughs> it's, it's not that hard. I read, I read and watched and yeah. listened. Uh, yeah. Same. Stupid. That's a, that's a conversation to me that shouldn't even have to be had. <laughs> like, shouldn't we be past this stuff? I guess not. No. Um, whatever. Whatever. Uh, I, I uh, you know, was feeling, feeling a certain way uh, about next week's episode. For episode 49, I had something in mind, but I changed it last minute. <clears throat> I want to I, I watch a, a movie uh, uh, 
that you haven't seen it's kind of like a movie that i'm gonna i'm gonna be the guy to just push you to watch it finally and i know it's been on your list for for ages and that's uh 1991's boys in the hood john singleton was nominated for best director and best screen best original screenplay uh what we have to decide right now i actually want to do it right now while we're on air how do we want to face this episode next week because we have boys in the hood screenplay against bugsy the fisher king grand canyon and then the winner is thelma and louise fuck yeah and then <laughs> best and then best director is uh jonathan demi of course the win for silence of the lambs hell yeah big five john singleton barry levinson for bugsy oliver stone for jfk ridley scott for thelma and louise okay Oof. I, th- I think we should go director on that i mean we get to talk demi Oliver Stone, Ridley Scott, holy shit. Levinson and Bugsy, JFK, and Thelma and Louise are three other movies that have been on my list for God knows how long. So, okay. That would be fun as hell. Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm very down for that. We could kind of do a best director, best director sort of, sort of showdown and just, just see what's going on there. Uh, obviously, Silence of the Lambs is a big five winner. It's very hard to think about Demi losing, yeah. <laughs> that, <laughs> losing that one. But man, yeah, you're right. You know, Barry Levinson, Ridley Scott, and Oliver Stone are three fascinating filmmakers. And I, I'm down to try to watch uh, watch those four. I probably won't rewatch Sons and Lambs. I've seen it a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I'll, I'll, try to, uh, I'll try to get to those other four. Uh, and obviously, Boys in the Hood is what we'll give awards out to. And yeah, that sounds like fun. Hot damn. All right. <laughs> Let's do it. 49. So, so that, yeah, that'll be episode 49. Come back and join us for a little 1991 best director showdown sort of thing. But mostly, you know, we're, we're, we're honoring Boys in the Hood, an awesome, awesome film from the early 90s that just uh, everybody's got to see. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm excited to take the plunge. I love getting to explore new stuff. It's the best part of doing all this. Uh, exactly. Exactly. Next, uh, this week on the Film Go- Filmgasm podcast on Wednesday, very exciting. Uh, revisit into the beyond uh with a cool partnership we did with I- ibon press uh comparing their comic book adaptation of the beyond to the film itself uh josh will be on that one with me uh gonna be so much fun looking to all of fulci's work and talk comic books for a little bit uh and of course on tomorrow's sneak preview caleb and i will be doing mortal Kombat, which came out last week got pushed because of the oscars so tune in for that epic story a cool movie <laughs> hell yeah yeah then of course we've got giggle guys on friday who knows what they're doing <laughs> oh i know <laughs> <laughs> i know what's going on yeah <laughs> gonna be fun <laughs> hell yeah well thanks for listening guys uh this was a blast as always and uh keep watching movies